the home audio gear we use and we love. We're here with Teo Nicolakis. How you doing, my friend? Happy Sunday to you. Happy Sunday to you too, Gene. How you doing? How you feeling? And I guess it's a good thing we pushed the show back because everybody got a chance to finish watching Playoff Sunday on football. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I've been suffering with this uh, damn bronchitis that would not go away. Thank you, Don Dunn. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you know what? This is kind of a fun live stream to do. It's kind of gratuitous for us because we get to brag about the equipment that we use. Um, you know, sometimes you have to remember, even though we're influencers, I hate, I kind of hate that term, but we are influencers or reviewers. At the end of the day, we're still consumers. We're still audio enthusiasts. We're still passionate about this hobby. And you and I were talking about this. I'm like, what really gets you excited about this? What gear do you own or use that really excites you? And there's a couple of things on this list that have made my experience over the last couple of years transformative. And that's hard to say because I've been doing this now for over two decades. So almost nothing impresses, at least me. It doesn't impress me anymore because I've seen it all. But you're always the glass half full kind of guy. I'm always the glass half empty kind of guy. So I know. So we, we balance each other out. Uh, and I think what was fun as as we were prepping for this and sort of throwing ideas back and forth, it, it was, I think, just an opportunity for you and me to be on the couch with everybody in the audience and say, um, you know, when we're not talking about uh, a review that's coming up or or something in the industry, we're really talking about the what we love. And that's the passion of music or or movies or entertainment and a lot of times the gear that we use, we're doing, we own it for a particular reason. And um, we said, why don't we just do a show on it? It'll give us a chance to talk about some of the gear, um, why we own a particular set of gear and uh, just see where it goes. So I think it's going to be a fun time. Yeah. I, got a, I just want to answer a couple of comments here. So someone goes, so do I go to bed or do I get a good night's sleep or listen and watch the Audio Hawks live stream? Obviously, the answer is you watch the live stream. You could always catch up on sleep at work. And tomorrow, I don't think anybody's working because it's MLK Day, at least here in the United States. So, yes, sit here and watch us rant for the next 45 minutes or an hour. And then someone goes, are you warming up doing squats with your subs? <laughs> Not today. Um, probably will next week, but yeah. Not today. Someone's asking, oh, we haven't any more plans doing Arc Genesis coverage. So I think we will because Teo's getting a AVM 90 in for review. Yep. So, and that looks like a game changing kind of product. So I'm hoping you get that soon because that's, we're excited to cover that. I love the MRX 1140. I use that in my uh, bedroom system and I love Arc Genesis. It's just yeah. the simplicity of it working is all a good thing. I'm excited for that. We've been waiting two years for the review unit, and I'm I'm hoping it's going to be well worth the wait. So yeah, absolutely. Last one here. Someone just talked about the baseaholic chart. I'm glad people find this useful because we put a lot of effort into this, and no other magazine has actually done this level of testing for subwoofers or actually try to tabulate them all into one central location and also give a room size rating. So it's a it's a brilliant thing, I think, in helping consumers and you look at our reviews and you could determine how much subwoofer you need for your room. I've spent a lot of time, you know, years kind of perfecting that whole test procedure and I've had many manufacturers uh, endorse it and agree with it. So yeah, appreciate that shout out. And guys, if you want to see the latest Spaceaholic Excel spreadsheet, it's on our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. We just posted a review of the Klipsch uh, K121SW. I think that's the subwoofer. And it has the baseaholic and measurements and all that stuff. And in about a week or two, I'm going to have James Larson on, and we're going to go over the best $500 subwoofers for 2023. So we have about four or five on that list, and I want to go over it with you guys. And it should be a fun live stream. It's great. It's great. So what do you say? Should we? All get right. Started? Well, let me. Yeah, let's get your slide presentation going here. Here we go. So the audio gear we love to use. What we use when we use it and and why we love it. So Gene and I went back and forth and we'd love to hear you all in the live chat, but I think we came up with a, a series of descriptives as to why does somebody own a particular piece of audio gear? And what we came up with was that, hey, 
it just brings us a heck of a lot of enjoyment. Uh, you know, we're enthusiasts, not reviewers. So we just want to enjoy the gear that we own. Um, something that's elevated uh, performance or pioneering technology, and that's moved the envelope of performance. I mean, Gene, on this particular point, that could mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But for me, this is upgrade itis. And mm -hmm. some of the things that we're going to talk about, at least for me, that's really what that solved is something just wasn't right. I, I felt, gee, there's another level that that I could achieve in, you know, my audio or, or home theater entertainment. And that's something that I was really striving for. What do you think about the next point? That notion about the unique connection? What does that mean to you? Oh, absolutely. I think if you have a good experience with a product and you connect with it, it's I'm kind of a sentimental person, right? So like, I obviously I make connections with people, but at the same time, I make connections with equipment or I feel like if I sell a piece of audio gear that I've had for years, I actually feel bad about it. I mean, I remember this is going to sound embarrassing, but I remember one year, years ago, I'm talking like 20 years ago when I first got into RBH speakers, I had my first set of really high end towers from them and they put the high end drivers in their wood boxes when it came time to upgrade, I actually boxed them up and I sold them to somebody. And I started crying when the UPS guy came because I spent, I spent, it was like right after college, I spent years, I got my first job. I spent years kind of saving up money to buy a product like this and then to just kind of push it out the door. And I knew something else was coming, but the fact that I it was blood, sweat and tears and I was on this journey of finding the right speakers that fit my musical preference and my music and my taste. To see that go, it's like letting, you know, letting a child go to college or something, right? I mean, it was like, it was emotional for me. And I know people probably think that's crazy, but I do definitely get emotional connections when I'm into something. It, same thing with cars, too. Like when I got rid of my Acura TL Type S, that one hit me hard because I had that car for a long time and I cared for it and I customized it, but I sold it. I, I was looking for a good person to buy it and someone that would really appreciate it. And that's... Same thing with audio gear. I always want to have somebody who's going to own the next piece of gear that I've owned to really make a good connection with it. I, I had that same experience with a Marantz AVR, had no HDMI connections, and also my very first pair of audiophile speakers. Hey, Nick, how are you? Thanks for the super chat. Cool. Uh, Boston Acoustics, uh, HD6s. Oh, yeah. Going back. Uh, in the day. And I, I think they were $250. Uh, I got them from this guy in Beverly, Massachusetts, who did uh, custom installation. I got them for 20% off. And it was just really a, a big thing. I kept them up until three years ago and gave them to my nephew. Talk about nostalgia. So I, I totally get it. So I got a funny Boston acoustic story for you. Actually, two that are kind of related. Um, years ago, my brother, Steve and I, who's, who's seven years older than me, he's my second youngest brother. So he's, you know, the next one up, he and I were always in competition with each other to see who could have the better audio system, right? That's one of the motivations for me starting audio Hawks is I checkmated him permanently. And, um, I owned a pair of JBL speakers at the time and the LX 44s, which were a great speaker for a college kid. You know, I, I think I got them when I was graduating high school. I spent a whole summer at Publix working just so I could buy these speakers. They were $400 a pair, which was a lot of money back in like 1990, right? And for years, I used these speakers and I was content. And then my brother got a different pair of speakers. I think he got Advent Heritage or something, right? He goes, it's time for me to upgrade because he was seven years ahead of me. He's an engineer. He was making more money than me. He's been out in the field longer. He goes, so he brings home a pair of Boston Acoustics Towers, and I was not familiar with the brand at all. I'm like, oh, my JBLs are going to kill him. My JBLs were beating every speaker we would bring over in my house. It was like nothing could beat these speakers for $400, even though they were old, right? When he brought in those Bostons, um, I couldn't believe the clarity of the mid-range that I was hearing. And it just had an epiphany that it was time for me to upgrade. So that's when I started going to the audio shops with him. That's the first time we actually heard a three-way center channel. Boston Acoustics was one of the first to do a WTMW center channel when everyone else was doing MTMs. So I had a, I, I had a really good eye-opening experience with Boston Acoustics, and I had a lot of respect for the brand. And then unfortunately, when they got bought by, it was DNM Holdings, which owned Denon and Marantz at the time, they turned them into garbage can speakers. 
their whole line of speakers went from these beautiful audiophile speakers to things that looked like the robot from Star Wars. <laughs> and then the brand's gone now. You don't hear anything about Boston Acoustics anymore. I know. I know. Sadly, I have a lot of great brand. I know. I know. Yeah. So that's the whole thing is we can get to talking about all that. So design, I mean, there's some incredible speakers that have just really unique designs because those things have to live in a living room. So I think design naturally plays a role sometimes in why we choose particular uh, products. And uh, again, like you said, that brand loyalty or connection, I'll never forget, I had an NAD stereo preamp. It was my first preamp. And I still remember the feeling of the volume button. It was unlike anything I'd ever felt before. It was like yeah. utter. And the engineering, the quality of the parts, you, you just really appreciate so many different things. Uh, that's what led me to get the 5CD carousel from NAD back in the day. So those Look, things- I'd give anything to go, just one day to go back to like my childhood when I had perfect hearing, of course. <laughs> And I had my JBLs with my Pioneer receiver and my five disc CD changer. And I put on, you know, for the first time, I put on the new Genesis album, which was uh, We Can't Dance. To hear that again for the first time on that system, I would bring us, it would bring tears in my eyes. <laughs> the nostalgia is definitely, and I still have a, an affinity for JBL because for years I always strived to have JBLs. I wanted the JBL 100 T3s, which were out of my price range. But that was the reference kind of monitor at the time. So there's definitely a nostalgic factor where people pick and choose the products that they really connect with on an emotional level. I think that's just great. And then a couple of other things is it delivers a unique music or, or entertainment solution. Uh, I'm a, you know, as a tech guy, that's, that's what I do day in and day out. I'm so used to problem solving. Yeah. And I'm always, for me personally, I'm always looking for gear that's really going to fit in and and be flexible for me um, to solve certain things. And as we'll get to, uh, Rune is on my list. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Rune in a little bit. And usability. I mean, Gene, how many times, uh, you know, Bertha in your uh, case or Cleo in my case, and it's like, how do I turn on the TV with this thing? So mm -hmm. having products that are super easy to use or or give you some joy with the user interface, right? Um, I've had one product that you and I talked about recently, and it, it does a really great job functionally, but it has such a kludgy UI. I'm not sure that I would enjoy using it. And, mm -hmm. and that plays a big role sometimes, even though it might be technically superlative. If you don't enjoy using the product, you're just not going to do that. Yeah. Um, right. And then it, if it supports a certain standard or technology. I mean, hey, I'm not going to really go looking at a pre-pro unless it has balanced outputs. I mean, XLR outputs like that for me is just a uh, a bias that I have. So that's the way my setup has been for a decade plus. That's a requirement. That's what I want. Or, you know, I want to be able to play uh, FLAC files, ALAC, blah, 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 or, or some protocol that I want to support. And, you know, that's that's a determining factor that's a filter or a lens through which i look at the product and gene what's the last point gear we want gear, our yeah. audience right yeah. so yeah. something we hope you can uh share with us a joy you know sometimes it's always fun talking to somebody's like i've got that product and then we just go mm -hmm. and talk about what really makes that so that shared experience is always just really a lot of fun that is a huge thing. You know, you want people that that a community of people that have similar products that you could share. Maybe you could even get tips on how to make those products sound even better, right? Or perform better or placements or something. It's true. And even the recent video, so shout out back about the calibration profiles. It's just been great to see people engaging about how helpful that's been. You know, some people have a certain bias towards a particular room correction system. And, and again, being able to share a uh, common experience, uh, problem solve that that's really all, all yeah. great. All right. So I guess I'm up first with, with my fave. And I got to tell you, I have absolutely fallen in love with the Denon AVRs. Um, I think I check off a couple of those boxes as to why the uh, X8500 HA is is one of my favorites and, and what I use day in and day out. Um, I first had um, an experience with Denon's flagship with the 7200 several years ago. Yeah. And it came in for review and it really wowed me. 
I hadn't considered using, I've been a separates guy and uh, that's been the case for a long time. And the 7200 was really the first time that I'm going, wow, this AVR really performs great. And then to get the 8500H just elevated everything. I mean, this is really an incredible performer. And I have it uh, in my theater room. So it's running a 7.2.6 setup. So the fact for me is it's got 13 channels. It decodes uh, Dolby Atmos, DTSX, DTSX Pro. Um, it's IMAX Enhance and it does Oro 3D because I have everything um, configured down um, here where I am for both a Dolby Atmos and a um, an Aura 3D setup was, was really key for me. The platform is stable. I have no problems with it whatsoever. It just, if I want something, I, I program my home automation system, I get the Denon to work and bam, it's fine. It does absolutely everything I need. It sounds great. And I mean, when you look at, this thing, it's just a beast. Yep. You have all the internal amplification. Um, you have a, a bulletproof amplification on the inside. All the binding posts are high quality. I could just go on and on. And this is the the denim in my, my salamander rack. And just everything is beauty. So for me, I'll sit down here. I have it connected to the RBH SVTRs. And I'll just get lost either in two-channel music or again, this is sort of where I'll, I'll get lost in, in any sort of um, immersive audio movie experience or what have you. So it's well, the cool thing great. about Denon, the cool thing about flagship receivers, especially Denon, and I don't know how long you've been into audio uh, following this stuff as I have, like in the late 90s, early 2000s. You're a little younger than me. We're about the same, right? You're like 47, 48, something like that. Um, I was a separates guy too. I had the Aragon soundstage and yeah. their separate amplifiers. And I heard the difference between mid-level receivers and separates. It was night and day. But then Denon, Yamaha, Sony, and Integra Research got into a what I call super battle, super AV receiver battle from about the 90s to about 2005. And they kept one up in each other. And they were making you know, 70, 80 pound, 90 pound receivers and these things, <clears throat> they had more technology in them than the separates did. The separates would only change, the, the technology in the, in the processes would only change every four or five years, whereas these flagship receivers would come out every two years, they'd have a new flagship, right? And they were all neck and neck. And then Denon released the 5805, and it was just an anvil on the industry. That thing was a beast, 10 channel, 100 pound, you know, um, 1700 uh, VA transformers in it because they had like one big transformer, two other ones. So the thing would do a legitimate 170 with like seven channels driven all day long. I mean, this thing was a beast and nothing sounded like it and with the quad DAX and everything. That's when I really started paying attention to what one box can do if it's properly engineered. Right. And then after the 5805, the market kind of shrank on those super receivers and we kind of saw the mid price receivers take over. So when Denon came out with the 7200, I was like, that's good, but it's nowhere near to the level of what the old CI receivers were. But then all of a sudden the 8500 and the A1 came out and yeah. they're still not up quite to that level, but you know what? They're, they're bridging the gap and they're, they're bringing back the super receiver. They're bringing you respectable performance, an amplifier system that could actually drive four ohms without shutting down or going into some weird protection mode. And of course, all the latest in processing. So I could totally understand how you're now a Denon fanboy because that's a special product that's built in the Shirakawa factory in Japan. So that's exactly. like their prestigious factory. And it's it's a beautiful piece. So I totally get that. And the fact that it's stable is speaks volumes too. You know, a lot of these esoteric products, the separates products, they get buggy. It is. So, so for me, it's the performance. It's the flexibility. So in in that slideshow, uh, what you see right now, and we lost Gene for a second. Uh, somebody said there's lots of wires. That's because what the way that I have the Denon working right now is I have it configured to um, toward for an external power amp. So I have seven channels, 200 watts each. That's driving all the um, the floor standing speakers. So it's really just a, a 
great product, super flexible, does whatever I need. And uh, I got to tell you, with um, now Multi QX with with Odyssey Multi QX, I've been tweaking the curves and i just love it so that's all that, we should do more videos on that tail i'm waiting for you to do another video on that i know so i owe the community i keep getting shout outs as tail we want you to do a follow-up so i do i owe you all some uh, multi qx uh video so that's going to be coming that i promise cool we got another super chat from nicholas have you had any recent experience with open baffle not a whole lot personally um i've seen some at the trade shows over the years um I know, I know there's a big following for that for audiophile community, and I've heard some good ones like NOLA, for example. They made some nice ones, but we generally don't cover that stuff. It's not really as mainstream as it should be, and there's pros and cons to it. I mean, there's you get less efficiency, of course, but you can get some good sound. And in fact, there's one, I think, um, Dennis Murphy, I think, makes an open baffle speaker that has the mid-range open baffle on it that's really good i think james larson reviewed so definitely check out our reviews on that so that's great so gene you've got your favorite <clears throat> yeah so this is a unique product there's only two processors on the market that give you above you know the 16 channel gold standard of flagship processors right there's the storm audio and there's the trinov and they're kind of neck and neck. They both are expandable. This this one could go up to 32 channels. I know the Trinov could go actually to beyond 70 channels, but it gets super expensive. And the Trinov has some other advantages. It's got um, a little bit more tech integrated into it. It's a little bit more of a time-tested platform. But Storm's been out for a while now, and they've been having time to really refine it. And now I think Storm has just upped one on Trinov with the Dirac Art. The acoustic, uh, the, the latest generation of um, room correction from them that we're going to be testing. I think we're going to be testing it at the end of March, early April. It's called the Direct Live Active Room Treatment. And I did a video with Matthew Pose on this, and we have an article up on audiohalts.com. But what I love about this product is this and the Trinov are the only two that I know of that give you digital audio outputs. So in my case, I'm running active speakers for the front three LCRs. There's no crossovers in my speakers. All of it's done in an external DSP box. And rather than doing the whole analog to digital, digital to analog conversion, I bypassed all that because there's digital outputs on this thing that go right into my Mirani DSP. And I do all the FIR corrections on my speakers and have all the processing on that. But that's a huge advantage. The noise floor on this system is exceedingly low. You can't hear any hiss at all. It just sounds really clean. And the fact that I have unlimited PEQ manual adjustments on this, plus it's got direct live, it's got direct bass control, it's got pretty much every version of direct. It's the only processor that we know of, at least now, that's going to support the new active room treatment from uh, direct. And the way you can configure this thing and the base management you can do. So I'm using my mega flagship speakers and I'm able to run LFE to those speakers as well as all the sum base from all the other channels. You can't do that with pretty much any other AV processor on the market other than the Trinov. There's just very few products that give you this kind of flexibility. It's really more of like a commercial grade product because of the speaker assignments, all the advanced things you can do i mean you could run multiple sets of side speakers most processes you can't do that so if you've got if you've got a multi-row theater that you're building that's got more than two rows three or four rows and you want to have good coverage for all the seats you can't just do it with two side speakers most processes won't let you do multiple side speakers this one does you can assign as many speakers to whatever channel you want so it's, it's incredibly powerful but it also has a big learning curve have you found in terms of like i'm thinking Storm Audio would be great. So in my setup, I have both the Canonical Oro 3D and the DTSX. It seems like this would be a great product if somebody had uh, a, a speaker layout that they wanted to be flexible with, or perhaps they didn't have the perfect layout and they need to make some accommodations. Because I think you can create phantom speakers through the configuration, or am I thinking of a different product? I know the Trinov will do a phantom center with multiple centers. I mean, there's some processing in there that does that. I don't think Storm has that ability yet, and it's not something I've actually looked at. Um, but this one thing that's cool about this product, too, is even if you have a standard Dolby Atmos setup, a speaker layout, 
you know, on a lot of the Sound United products, you can't even, uh, you can't activate Oro 3D. You can't use the height channels unless you have them configured as height channels. This will still remap to those speakers and you could still get height, even if they're tops. That's great. Yeah. So it's just, there's a lot of advantages to having a product like this. If you're doing a dedicated home theater space and you want all the different configuration flexibility, there's nothing more flexible than this or the Trinov. And obviously I don't have the Trinov. Uh, Matthew Pose has the Trinov and he's like, you know what? I'm actually thinking about swapping the Trinov out now for the storm because of this D-Rack thing. So Trinov has got some catching up to do. And no, it, it's forward. impressive. Yeah. I, you know, we get a chance to talk and not everybody sees it, but I haven't seen you talk about uh, a pre-pro or an AVR. In other words, basically a processor as highly as you've talked about this product. This has really stuck out for me. So I'm I'm really glad you got a chance to put this on the list and, and talk about it a bit. And it's not cheap. So I, you know, I know people look look at something like this. I think it was like 24 grand the way it's configured for 24 channels. But again, um, if you're building the very best home theater system with multiple channels beyond just 7.1.4 and you want to be able to support different speaker configurations, different seating locations. You want to have the most advanced room correction system. You want to have incredible base management control. I mean, for example, I could measure every speaker I want interfacing with REW, and I can make sure that my subs are aligned with every channel. I could adjust the crossovers, the high pass filters, the low pass filters, the slopes, the shape of those filters. Yep. It doesn't just have to be a Linkwitz Riley. I could use Bessel filters. And I went and I did that for all, I don't know how many channels I have. I have nine plus six, like 15 channels plus four subs. I went in and I measured each speaker individually to make sure I had the best high pass, low pass response with relation to the subs. So there was no suck outs, you know, in the transition. And it just, it gives you such a seamless sound when you can actually have that flexibility and you take the time to do something like that. I don't recommend it if you have OCD like me, because you'll be in your room for hours going in and just measuring and remeasuring and listening and remeasuring. And I'll do that. I'll put myself in a rabbit hole where I'll spend a half a day measuring and adjusting. And then I wind up back to the settings I had the day before. <laughs> I'm like, damn, I can't beat myself. That's great. That's great. Well, that's, that speaks volumes. And on that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your other favorite? So this RBH. is really, you know, as you guys know, I'm a big RBH fan. I've been, I've had all their flagship speakers for the last two decades. And of course, there's a special place in my heart for the status ATs, which were a passive speaker with those triangle little bottoms with the three woofers. I don't know if I had you over my house to ever do to listen to those. They have yep. a, that those we were there in your other house. So uh, guys, I did. I got a chance to listen to them. They were great. We got an experience, and we were not in the mother-in-law seat either. Exactly. Yeah. So that system was incredible because there was no EQ on it. It was all done passive, and RBH just the Shane Rich was brilliant in making that speaker, and he tuned it perfectly. Like it just sounded good right out of the gate. But he's like, "I'm going to get you to trade those speakers," and I'm like, "There's no way, Shane. I'm I'm." fully content. I'm, I'm never trading my speakers again. I'll die with these speakers. They'll be put in a mausoleum with me. So when people come and visit, they could get a good experience. Right. He's like, no, I'm coming up with an active speaker system. I'm like, oh shit. I've always wanted an active speaker system. Right. So when he showed me this system, um, and it wasn't even with the top module, it was just the, the bottom and the middle. And he showed me what this thing could do with with all the active DSP. I was like, wow, this is a speaker that's fully tunable to your room. It's a it's game changer. This is the future of audio when you can actually make adaptable speakers to your room. So then I finally heard the triple stack with the woofers on top, the mids in the in middle with the tweeter and the bot and the woofers on the bottom. And when you get this thing dialed in, it's like it's just next level. It's like it's almost like it's a surreal experience when you're in a, a really good acoustically controlled room. Like I have thanks to Anthony Grimani. He was a big help in that. Um, when you're in the sweet spot and you get this thing dialed in the phantom center, you get from having perfect match between the left and right speakers. It's very difficult to do that with a passive speaker. I think the only thing that, that, that could come close to this is that perilous and uh, S T's, which I also own. And that speaker alone should make it on this list too, but I don't want to be here for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but this is just a next level system. It's just the, the way you could tune this to your room and all the tweakability of it and how powerful it is. I mean, I could hit 120 dB levels if I wanted to. Not that I recommend that because I want you guys to preserve your hearing. But then hearing those uh, eight 12 inch woofers just thumping and giving you real tactile bass and clean bass. It's just, it's, I put it, it puts a smile on my face every time I could sit down and just listen. And the thing I noticed more than anything is when I go in this room, it's a home theater room. It has seven seats in it. It's meant to do movie watching. I would say 90% of the time I'm listening to music. Right. I'm yeah. the same way. It's it, for me, it's all about music and these things, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So I have the, the SVTRs as you know, so mine mm -hmm. is the top modules, but not active. And my question to you is what I found so incredible about the SVTRs is they image incredibly well, but the, the emphasis of how can I, how can I describe it? It's the quality of the base. Not yeah. that it's, it's just intense, but it's textile. It's, it's textured. So how, how would you say these are um, compared to the previous ones that you had? They're different. Um, like the AT had a more damped bass sound to it. Like it almost sounded like if 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 you're a drummer and you take the the back head of the bass drum off and you stuff it with a bunch of towels and then you hit that kick drum and it just has a kind of a thud sound. I miss that. I don't quite get that with these speakers. Um, this is definitely more visceral, way more visceral because you got more surface area. And it's very tight as well. So, I mean, I like them both, but there was something about listening to the old ATs with vinyl because vinyl itself is not flat. It's, it's EQ'd in itself. And I put on like an old jazz record and I would just melt in the room. Like I have not been able to recreate that in this room, even with the, with the rebels up here, not even close, Interesting. not even close, not even close. So I'm missing that, but Hopefully, I'm going to be able to report on a way to get that back in the next month or so because RBH is coming with a new speaker that I can't talk about yet. But um, but no, this this is a very special system. You've heard this system, um, and I think others on here have as well because they were at Florida Audio Expo a year or two ago, demoing this system, maybe you no know, three years ago. And um, there's people on our forums that actually own this system as well, so they could attest to it. And in fact, we just have a super chat here from Joey. Will you be at the Florida Audio Expo? I'll be at the Sound Audio Orchard Audio Room working with Leo. I don't know how to say that name. Owner, designer of Orchard Audio. Yes, I will be at Florida Audio Expo. I'll be covering that for two days. And I have a couple of people in my crew that I'd be going. So we'll definitely look out for you, Joey. Thanks for the super chat. And I haven't been to, because the question here from Acoustics, I haven't been to this new uh, house that that you have so that's on the to-do list in the cupping coming months or so yes uh, i was at the older one but i will tell you the john ergel theater at Harmon in northridge california is just phenomenal and if you had a chance to see our other live show where i talked about that uh, yeah that's something special especially the bass that's coming out in that theater is unreal <laughs> it's just unreal is the only way to describe it well, I'm hoping you come and visit me after I put the 21 inch sub in. That's what I was kind of waiting for. I, I saw that <laughs> video. And guys, if you haven't seen that with, with uh, Gene and Shane, I mean, yeah. that just looks intense. Carbon fiber. So, yeah, we can geek out on that. That'll be great. All right. So we're going to do it at some point. We're going to do it soon. Yeah. And then uh, Acoustics was asking, what does RBH do so well that other brands aren't able? I wouldn't say other brands aren't able to do anything RBH is doing. There's no magic to it. I just think most brands have bean counters more than RBH. I think RBH is a company that does it for the passion of audio. And may maybe that's why they're not as big as they should be. You know, I don't think someone, I don't think a company like Harman is going to make a product like this because it's too big. It's too complicated. It's, it's too much red tape to deal with. You can't make a lot of money on a product like this. So I, I'm sure that these guys at Harman are more than capable of making a speaker like this, but it's just, it's not economical for them to do something like that right so that's why i love companies like rbh they're small enough where the guys are like us they're enthusiasts they love the stuff they'll customize they'll do something that you think of in your head and that's why i'm a big fan of them it's great it checks off all the boxes doesn't it yeah definitely well there you go there's your your dsp so i don't know if you want to make any comment on that 
Yeah, that's well, that's the Marani DSP that works with that speaker system. It's it's a pain in the ass to use, but it's the very highest quality DAC in there. It's a commercial grade DAC. It's very uh, clean. And then that's the eight channel amplifier that uses Pascal amplification. So everything that's in the Audio Hulk's uh, home theater room is class D. I moved away from class AB. Uh, class D has gotten to the point now where it's as good or better than the very best linears and it's much more space efficient and it's much more heat efficient. So my rack does not run hot and I've got a 16 channel storm audio amp, which uses the same Pascal modules. And then I've got this eight channel amp running the front three speakers. So there's a lot of amplification. If that was class AB, that thing would be like, I'd be warming my house up, especially in Florida. You don't want to do that. Plus I wouldn't have enough power. You know, I'd have to put more dedicated outlets in there to come overcome the efficiencies, inefficiencies of class AB. No, oh, that's true. That's true. And just look at, I mean, it's really gorgeous engineering. And, mm -hmm. you know, they they changed the the structure of how the feet are on the newer models, which I think is my great. request because the freaking thing with just the cones was unstable. I felt like someone was going to knock it over and kill a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and leave it to Shane to do just really man crushed by seven foot speaker <laughs> it would have been me I would have been crushed by the speaker because I would be follow, screwing around with the cables or moving the speaker to get better sound oh so I did this I did this not for the consumer benefit but for my own safety <laughs> it's great it's great and speaking of Harvard <laughs> my favorite is uh, the Ultima 2 Salon I have to tell you that I had speaker upgrade itis from yeah. college. And and for me, it was I had the three foot fishers. Remember, we would come with the audio cabinet with and the, the whole 15 thing. inch woofer with the, <laughs> the, the magnet on that woofer was smaller than the magnet on a tweeter, but they still thumped. <laughs> so I go to college and and uh, one of my friends, Steve Booza, is there and he's got these little infinity bookshelf speakers. And I walk into his room, he played saxophone, he's listening to some classical music. I'm like, wow like that is incredible the sound he's like yeah these are my infinities they're great and that was really one of the catalysts that that got yeah. me into it um and then it was the boston acoustics for me and then at, at some juncture i had the the rebel performa m22s and i liked them and i was really looking for the sound that i wanted in my house and and i really had auditioned a lot of different brands this and that and then when I started reading, because these came out around 2007, I think, these seven or eight, um, I started reading all the reviews and it was really the, the measurements, this and that. I said, I, I really have to try to strive for this speaker. Like this was my, my end game. And then one of the local um, hi-fi stores, they had this in um, and I went and I listened and I was like, wow. It, I wanted a tower. I wanted full range. Um, and I wanted a beryllium driver. That's one of the things that I also, uh, beryllium. That, but yeah, that, that's one of the things that I really, um, was trying to hone in on is what are the materials? So I was, I was looking between magna planar. I was looking at electrostat, um, trying to really discern what it was. And to me, it was about two channel music first and then growing, um, out from there in, into home theater. So I wanted a speaker that was full range. I had listened to some uh, Joseph Pulsars, if I remember correctly, and they were great. They were dynamic, but really that's what my goal was. And let's, and just, pref let's just preface this, that this is Rebels currently their only full range speaker. Let's be honest, because yep. I've got the F328s behind me, which is a newer, cheaper version they don't play as low as the salon twos. They go, they're about, they're tuned about 10 Hertz higher. They're higher efficiency. So they'll play louder with less power, but they don't get you the base extension that you're getting out of the salon twos. These will go down to 18 Hertz in my room with room gain. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, it is truly a full range speaker. You do not need a subwoofer at all with these, with the salon twos. And, and that was to me is once I brought the salon twos into my house, I stopped having any itch whatsoever to upgrade my speakers. Like, it's just, it's magic. I, I, I sit in front, I listen to music and, and that's it. Um, the, the, the performance of these things for me has just been really 
incredible musical bliss. And I appreciate a couple of things. So for me, is I wanted a speaker that could really bring out the emotion uh, of music the details. I, I'm one who really is enamored with the way a soundstage is and how to place all that. And these checked off all of those boxes. The, the top end in the mid range is just phenomenal. The other thing is the way that you've got the design here. I mean, look at the way that the baffle is contoured, right? You know, it, it's um, mm. everything is really well designed. And then you actually on the back, you have a, a boundary switch to address if you bring these into a room because you know they're really made for for the two channel guy who isn't going to necessarily have room correction so you can set the the boundary switch that will actually attenuate the base and same thing you can deal with it um with the tweeter so it's great it's got a little hatch on the back so it hides all the cables just that you need to use space look i love the baffle on it look at the geometry on the baffle that way you get good dispersion characteristics and you know there's no discontinuity discontinuities there and the fact that they have a tapered mid-range they have a smaller mid-range and a bigger yeah. mid-woofer i mean they put a lot of engineering I, I think i mean i don't know what happened with Harman and samsung bought them i don't know if they just killed the revel budget because i thought they were going to come up with a salon 2 replacement but i just don't see a lot of money being thrown at revel right now like they don't have like a really kick-ass subwoofer which they had that 15 which i think is out of production now yeah so I hope that they come back and come out with a replacement to the speaker. Not that it diminishes the quality of this product, but it was made, what, in 2007, right? So yeah. the fact that it, it remained a flagship for that long uh, speaks volumes for how well it was engineered when it came out. This is still a stereophile Class A rated speaker. I don't know that there's any other speaker in the history of stereophile that has remained on their class mm. A list as long as the Salon 2 has. It's just, it's uh, just really an incredible piece of engineering. I love it. I, I can't tell you how much enjoyable this speaker is. And yes, we'll get to the per listen in a second. So you, you're losing a little bit of thunder here. So no, Gene, awesome. let's talk about your YU6s. So this is just a budget speaker. I saw a couple of YouTubers doing videos on these and and I ran into um I ran into Canto at the audio advice show and I was like, "You know what? I'd like to check out. I don't have any speakers at my desk cuz I got the Rebels behind me. I've got speakers in the ceiling. In my old house, I had a really high-end uh system on my desktop and I miss it, right? I was like, I got headphones here. I got the Focal Stellias here. I'm not a headphone person. I use them as a utility more than as something I would sit down and just really enjoy. So they sent me these and they sent me their sub. I think it's the sub eight or sub eight pro. I forget. There's like a newer version, which I have. I have the latest version. And initially I hooked it up and I wasn't getting that great a sound. Like the bass wasn't good. I flipped the phase switch on it and all of a sudden everything just kind of went into place. And then I plugged it into my Focal uh, headphone preamp and I started putting on title, uh, lossless music. I, and I was just sitting here working one night. I was typing up a review. And then I realized I was lost in the music. I was literally lost. I felt that experience like I was in a high-end two-channel room. And I'm thinking to myself, these speakers are only like $400 a pair. And the sub is like 300 bucks. It literally changed my life working up here in a couple of months since I've been using this system. It's brought so much joy. I found so much new music on title like jazz artists i never would have found just sitting in my theater room just letting this thing use its ai and figure out what i would listen to next right and i just the fact that you can get this level of performance for so little money and they look beautiful at the same time and this company makes these speaker stands they're really primarily a stand company from what i've what, what i learned when i interviewed them they they were, they have this incredible metal shop so they make these custom sized stands they screw into the speaker so it's really secure. It's just a beautiful package. It's like, to me, this is what Apple would be if they made speakers, right? Except it, it's way cheaper because if it, if it had an Apple logo, it would be three times the price. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, so okay. if you guys don't know the brand, I would definitely check them out. In fact, they sent me the TUKs or the Tukes. I haven't even opened them yet because I've been so much enjoying these speakers. 
I can't wait to hear the Tukes because they're like a little bit bigger. They have the AMT tweeter. Um, but the subwoofer, I mean, the subwoofer is not like going to shake your house down or anything. It provides just enough bass to fill in the gap because these speakers don't have a lot of bass. They only have, a, I think, a five and a quarter inch woofer. So by getting the sub, it really adds a dimension to the sound and it doesn't take up a lot of space relatively easy to set up and it looks great so yeah if you don't have good audio at your desktop and you work a lot at your desk you owe it to yourself to check something like this out because i just get so much enjoyment out of this little system and it, it puts a smile on my face when i know how inexpensive it is for what you get it, it's such a great opportunity because a lot of monitors either have zero speakers built into them or yeah. if they do have speakers built into them they're total junk and you know you need something that can really bring a whole lot of enjoyment um i found that when i was doing a review of some desktop speakers specifically for for desk and monitoring you several years ago that i had done and it was just night and day because you're sitting there and it just elevated everything whether you're watching something on youtube or you're participating in a video conference it just it makes such a difference so it's all I good. put the name here because it's not on the slide. If anybody's wondering about the brand, they're called oh, Canto. Right. Yeah. So good stuff. I know you've spoken really highly of these. They're in our product of the year awards. If you go on our homepage, it's still somewhere in the middle of the page. And I and I included them in there. Or gift guide or product of the year. I forgot which one I put them in. But they're in there. So Rune, I will say that if I had to pick like my top three things, products of all time that have been influential to me in my musical experience. Rune is one of those products. Um, so Gene, we are going to do a, a live deep dive on Rune, but here's yeah, yeah. a little flavor because you need to get Rune. Uh, it's simply put. Um, I have, I've been a Rune user for years and I was running it on various computers. So this is a mix since we're talking about audio products. For me, it's been the Rune Nucleus. So Rune makes an appliance. It's turnkey. It's built to run mm -hmm. Rune. It's got gorgeous aesthetics. Uh, you look at this thing and you're like, wow, that's really something that is a conversation piece. It it looks like something out of Star Trek almost, the way they have the, the heat sinks designed. Nice. But it has HDMI out, you know, USB connections. You have... Um, digital audio. So everything that you need to connect it to your audio system is there. Plus it's Rune. So for me, Rune saw, uh, checks off a couple of different boxes that we talked about. A, the user interface of Rune is absolutely magnificent. It is great to work with. It's intuitive. It's slick. It's fast and it gives you a ton of detail on so many different things. So what it does for me, which is great, is all of my ripped CDs, all of my um, high res downloads and all of my music from Tidal and Cobuzz are all in a single interface. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. It just aggregates everything together. And then what I get on top of that is I get details about an album, about an artist, and then if I want to do a deeper dive to even compare music, so on the right side where it says my tracks, I have some high res downloads of, of classical and movie pieces. I can actually filter by things like dynamic range. So if I want to compare, let's say, a CD ripped version versus something that I've downloaded as an HD, um, so a 24 bit 192 and say, gee, is there a difference in the file? I mean, I can see from the dynamic range. So the, the metadata support that Rune has is just really phenomenal. And when I was considering different uh, media servers uh, at my house several years ago, the thing that really bugged me was that I was locked into something um, and I didn't want to be locked into, let's say, a particular protocol or a particular ecosystem. So Sonos is fantastic, but it's not for me as an example. What I wanted was something that would support AirPlay. I wanted something that was going to support Chromecast. And in Rune's case, they have the Root Rat protocol, which is really a bit-for-bit high-fidelity streaming protocol that you can stream to another speaker, to an endpoint. Uh, so for me, I can bring a Chromecast speaker or Chromecast device 
and boom, it integrates with Rune. I can bring an AirPlay device, boom, boom, it activates with Rune. So I can create speaker groups. I can do whatever I want in my house to tailor my musical experience. So it's been a fantastic thing for me in that regard. We got to definitely have you do a video on this because I know very little about, about Rune. I mean, the only music management systems I've used are built like Den and Heos or Yamaha Musicast, or I, I have J River, which is very difficult to use. So definitely this is a whole should... other level. And, yeah. and nothing against J River. Um, I have good friends and very you know well known reviewers who <laughs> love J River. I have not used the product now in many many years. But this to me is what clicked. You know, we, we talked about some of those those elements at the beginning of the talk. Mm -hmm. This is designed in a way that I love to use the product. And I can even set up different user profiles. So if I want for one of my kids, even a guest, you name it. And Rune just came out with an, an upgrade, their 2.0 upgrade. So now I can connect to my Rune library remotely and I can stream from my car. I can stream from my mobile device to headphones. It's great. So it gives me all sorts of details and statistics about my listening preferences. I can do a deeper dive by genre. So, you know, I seem to have a preference towards alternative or indie rock and contemporary. So I could just click on one of those and then I can do a deeper dive. So it's really helped me. So find does it, does artists. it have, does it set up its own playlist based on your listening habits? Kind of like Apple TV, Apple music and, and, and title. Yes, you, you can do all of that and more. So it'll mm -hmm. do recommendations. Um, it's, it's almost, I, I don't know. The problem with rune is it does so much in so many different ways. You can't just call it a music server. Mm -hmm. um, it really is the nexus of everything music for me. And uh, what I love about it as well is so let's say with my Cambridge audio um, streamer, the uh, CXN V2 streamer, uh, as an example, or with an OPPO or you name it, I can actually trace the fidelity of the signal path to see if I have any problems or any loss in quality. So oh, wow. in this case, I'm I'm streaming uh, an Apple lossless, an ALAC uh, 192 24-bit two channel, and it's going losslessly to the Cambridge, and then it's being upsampled to 384K, and I have a pure signal path from start to finish. And I can analyze that for every single song that I'm playing. It's like, again, what you can do with this is just so incredible. It I can't do multi-channel though, right? So... Rune does support multi-channel and you have to trick it into doing so. It does not do immersive audio. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was doing the, the, um, the review on Rune Arc and I had a chance to talk to the co-founders, you know, one of the things I tried to advocate for is that spatial audio is not necessarily a fad. And I think there's some challenges here because this is such a, an audiophile product. And hopefully, if you're a Rune user, it's advocate in the forums to show that there is really a desire and drive for multi-channel. But you have to trick it. If you're like using Cobuzz, you have to create a playlist through the Cobuzz interface. But then it'll actually um, bring in the 5.1 surround, and then you can play it through there. So Rune doesn't care as long as the um, the DAC or the endpoint delivery um, can support multi-channel directly. So but it's something like my um, the Oppo uh, UDP 205 or, or 203. They are native Rune streamers, um, but if I'm streaming, they only have a two-channel DAC that, um, that you have, so I'm going to get two-channel. Um, so again, I'm digressing a bit, but it, it gives you an idea of just the power of what Rune can bring um, to bear. So if you're a music lover and you haven't yet experienced Rune, you owe it to yourself. I do, man. I'm, I'm in the dust on this. I'm going to probably come back next year with the gear we love, 2024, and say Rune. <laughs> yeah, and what I love about Rune, because some there's one question about Amazon Music. Rune doesn't care. They want to integrate with everyone. And likely, if there is no integration, like on Apple Music or whatever, it's that that service hasn't provided or or isn't that friendly to providing you know, that native tie-in directly uh, mm. to Rune. But yeah, love it. Uh, essential. It has been so influential in my life. I use it for 
every single review. I use it every day of my life just about. So it's, yeah, this is one of the products I love. We got a super chat before we get off this topic from Nicholas again. Will Rune unfold title MQA to 196 on the AVM 90? I don't know anything about Rune apart from it's coming it's coming to Anthem. So Anthem only is Rune ready, but you still have to use an external device, right? I mean, it doesn't have the Rune software or interface built into it. So I, I th- there's a lot of folks who are looking at Anthem right now for, for Rune. So let me just give you a little parentheses. Um, if you are a Rune user right now, all you have to do is if you if you have, let's say, the Rune Nucleus like I do, or you're running it on um, a PC or a Mac, whatever it may be, just connect it either with a digital or an HDMI output to the AVM90 and boom, you're done. It still takes physical connections and maximize it in that capacity. There's nothing you necessarily need to wait for. The, the issue... I, I think, and maybe this is where some of the confusion arises, is if you don't have your Rune server near your AVM50 and you want to stream and connect to it over the network, that's where you, yes, the Rune integration is nice, um, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that the um, the AVM90, does it support Chromecast or AirPlay? I, yeah. I, I forget. The yeah, spec. I think it does. Yeah, it does. Okay, so here's your little trick. If it supports Chromecast, then what you do is you find the AVM90 in Rune under your audio settings. You configure it as a Chromecast device, and bam, you can stream it because Chromecast has higher resolution, if I'm not mistaken, over the network than AirPlay, which bugs the bejesus out of me. So would it be have. Chromecast over Ethernet, or would it be wireless? Yeah, Chromecast over Ethernet or wireless. doesn't matter. As okay. long as both... both rune and the avm 90 are on the same network you'll be able to find it configure it uh stream it and i'll i'll talk about that in a little bit because i have another product that you can see on the screen that's also on my list of favorites that i use all the time and it's the same thing so yeah okay so that's rune so i guess i'm up again with vocal um so i was running into a particular issue where I'm, i'm building out my my theater room and this has been an ongoing project since about 2015 and i said you know what i'm just gonna get rid of the freestanding speakers and i want to go in wall and looking again at some of those qualifications you know brand i love brand i've had great experience with i'd reviewed the focal 300s i made the decision to standardize the theater on the focal 1000 iw lcr sixes and there were a couple of things that drove me uh, to this. And I hadn't auditioned them, so I was sort of making a little bit of a blind investment. Um, number one is I wanted a beryllium tweeter again. And the ability to have something that was near or at the utopia uh, quality of Focal, something that had uh, good measurements, good linearity. And also I have a unique situation where I've got a concrete wall. And what's nice about the 1000 series is they come with Focal made um, uh, frames, brackets, that you can wall mount the speakers if you need to, not just do them in wall. So for that and several other reasons, the um, the tweeter and the mid-range there uh, turns and pivots so you can put it horizontally. I decided to start standardizing that. And that there is the frame, as, as you can see on one of the walls. Sweet. I can't tell you how happy I am with the performance of these speakers. I love these speakers. Love them. Absolutely love them. So I've got them as part of the uh, 7.2.6. I haven't yet finished the fronts. So that's uh, they're using the surrounds uh, right now. And then I've, I've got the RBHs at the front. So as soon as the front wall and then I, I get the new um, projector screen, the acoustically transparent and fix all that. Uh, I'll finish that up, but yeah, these are so where, where are the RBH is going to go after you do that. Cause this is going to be a whole Focal theater, right? Uh, it's going to be a Focal theater and the RBHs aren't necessarily going anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> You gotta love what we do, man. It's, I mean, we got Lambo and Ferraris in our driveway, right? <laughs> the equivalent of it in loudspeakers at least. Yeah. So I, I haven't figured that out, frankly. Um, because I love those speakers as well. 
You might um, have to build another room on the house. <laughs> Uh, anybody want to sponsor the uh, I'll put a name on it, room. but yeah, we could do that. We could do the two channel room. It'll be great. <laughs> so those are the uh, the focals. Uh oh, I got another one. I thought Man. it was uh, kicking over to you, but then all right. All right. Yeah. So somebody noticed that next to the salon twos there was a Perlison sub, and yes, it was James Larson's review of the Perlison D two fifteen that got me really hooked on the uh, Perlissons. I had an advance, uh, I had a dinner with a friend and colleague and they said to me, there's a new company that's out and it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. The measurements that this company is publishing it, are the measurements nobody else will publish. I'm like, really? And he said, yes. And he said, they are spectacular. He says the linearity, the this, that, we just went on it. So I I had never really found a sub that mated perfectly with my Salon 2s. So once again, um, really based on James Larson's review, um, it, it, it was at Dan Romer, um, mm -hmm. Gene. Yep. So spoke spoke to Dan and he says, wow, your room's pretty large and you've got a lot of space there. Um, the 215 would be ideal. I'm like, yeah, it's a little this and that. And he's like, They're well, huge. let me try. Yeah. So he says, let's try um, a couple of the D212s. So they shipped them to my house and they're big too. There's no question about it. And to give you an idea of the perspective, they're really, really big. But wow. This is the sub that every sub wants to be when it grows up. <laughs> I like it. that. That's that is I, I called Dan and I said, when I finish the review on on this thing, that's my quote is the sub. Every sub wants to be when it grows up. Oh, yeah. Where is that review? I haven't done it yet. That's on my oh. list. too. Oh, so right. That's another one that's in queue and pending. <laughs> so. I'm putting you on the spot, Tao. <laughs> so are you what running I, the salons base manager? You're running everything full range and the subs. Once I got this sub. I have not run the salons full range again. Nice. It is that good. Yeah. This, what I can tell you about this sub is somehow I felt at times that I would just love to have more power um, with, with the salons. And it would be really nice to be able to accommodate uh, some of that. But when I got the, the, the Perlissons, I will tell you, that A, it is absolutely seamless. You cannot tell any transition between the salons and the perlissons. And, and what I gained is I gained the texture, detail, control, and emotional engagement with music that just took it to a whole other level. Mm. I, I would listen to, to tunes that I knew so well and you're now really feeling the articulated texture of the instrument and all of those little nuances, you know, people like these guys are crazy. These audio file, these home theater folks. But I think you understand what I mean is there's something to music that reaches deep down into you and it draws an emotion that you can't explain. Music is magical. And the pairing of these two things is just awe-inspiring this is not the lowest playing sub on the market you have yeah. to have more subs right to get that That's it, the it's not the lowest playing run. but it might be the lowest distortion mind blown yeah just so i i love uh, several things about it the performance that's really what drew me but then the fact that you have all of these things uh in the palm of your hand with an app that you can make all of these PEQ settings. You have tremendous fine tooth control. This is just an incredibly well thought out product. And you can group the subs together and then you can actually apply things globally. So you can have a awesome. volume. Yeah. Uh, this why don't you do is... why don't you do a video just on the interface? Just to, just do it on the app. I mean, obviously, I want you to do a review. But I think you could break this into several videos and then do a video on how you calibrated the Salon 2s with this speaker. I mean, with the subwoofer. 
show the measurements and everything because this is i'm sure there's a lot of salon two owners or there's people that own flagship speakers that are audio files that are on the fence about getting subwoofers integrated into a two channel system because that's a dirty word but when you get a subwoofer that's so low in distortion that has such fast transient response because it has really low group delay right it takes things to the next level and it brings out details in your speakers you didn't hear before when they were running full range so there's a lot of advantages in even if it's just a two channel system even if you're only listening in one main listening position there's still advantages to have an active bass control in your two channel system. This is one of the things that Dan and I spoke about uh, when, when, when I set these up, I said to him, wow, like if I have a focal utopia, if I have an MBL, if I have like you, you name the flagship speaker, a calf, blah, 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 blah. I can use this product with any two channel system. And if I am using a, a, two channel pre pro and I don't want to have room correction. It's not part of it. I can do everything I need to tame the base through this product. And it is something that can live up to basically any flagship speaker and mate. Well, Oh yeah. Like, how blown away. Blown What's the away. price on someone's asking about the price on that sub. The retail on this guy is just shy of 7k it's 69.95 i think they're not cheap they're not they're not however and here's the however the and gene you correct me if i'm wrong the subs are are sized so the way that they have it the performance is almost the same for every single sub model but the way that they've designed them is they really take into account the size of your room and that's how you kind of determine the best model and then if you want either you know more base output you just scale up the sub so that's really their philosophy um behind it it's the same thing with their speakers too i mean uh, if you go from the r series to the s series tonal i've heard a comparison between the r70s and the s70s they sound very similar they sound more similar than they do different but the s series plays a good 3 db louder and it takes a lot when you want to meet that THX dominus level and you want to get super low distortion. It takes a lot to make a speaker play that loud and that clean. And that when we say 117 dB or 119 dB, that's at a super low distortion. They'll play louder than that, but they won't meet that THX dominus level. So just keep that in mind. We do have a super chat here. Uh, I wanted to address real quick from KB. The new Dirac Room EQ looks incredible. Can't wait for you guys to test it. What do you think will be the next big thing in audio beyond that? Honestly, I don't want to speculate because I'm so focused on this right now that I think this is the next game-changing thing in audio. If this works the way they claim it does and you're actually doing active manipulation of room modes using your speakers, what other thing would you want next in audio other than maybe um, virtual reality where you actually have a holodeck i mean this you know or binaural or true binaural in room would be the next big thing um just using two speakers but right now i say let's focus on this room correction thing let's see if it really works the way they claim it works and and we'll speculate after that because this is like too exciting to focus on anything else right now it's true i'll I'll close the pro listen discussion to say one other thing this to me is also a memory i i had gone to um, take five audio and they brought me into the back room and I was listening to Wilson. I don't know if it was the Watt puppy, but I'm like, wow, is, is that the bass coming out of those? And, uh, the owner Ralph says, no, he says it's the JL Gotham. So he oh, yeah, those the, are great subs, right? Yeah. And I had never heard bass like that. That yeah. was such an experience. It was etched in my mind that that's what superlative bass sounds like. I mean, that's where the J- that's where the Perlis and subs are targeting. They're targeting the the JL Gotham. Their it's best subs. Amazing. Yeah. So for for me, it checked off all those boxes about memory, experience, performance, and just really getting mm. lost in the emotion. So great sub, great sub. So so far, we got like four videos you're working on from this tale. We're gonna, yeah, we're I've gonna, got a whole year's worth of stuff. Yeah, I, I purposely I chose. I purposely chose products I already reviewed, so I don't have any homework from this. But I'm nailing you with all these things you got to do. Everybody <laughs> loves giving me homework. I'll tell you that much. Yep. So, Gene, 
another one of our favorites. You know what? Um, I've been a huge fan. I've watched Oppo from the from the early days when they when their first generation of DVD players came out. They weren't great. They were buggy. They were kludgy. They didn't perform that awesome. In fact, we we uh, wrote one of the technical manuals for one of their first players. They actually elected us to do that years ago. So this is how that company was just starting out, like grassroots and doing blue uh, DVD and Blu-ray players. Then they got to the point where they started really taking user feedback and implementing and going upscale, like the BDP players or the 83 SE. Then all of a sudden, like the Denons and the Pioneers, these guys got nervous, right? I mean, Oppo was doing it as good or better than these guys. In fact, I had the flagship $4,000 Denon that was great when it worked, but the transport would always get stuck or it was always buggy. And... I was getting tired of it. And then I meant I eventually got to the point where we had the BDP and I'm like, this thing measures just as good as the flagships from other brands. Then they came out with the UDP, which was like an anvil, man, 4K, incredible DAC performance, the very best ESS DACs. The only thing it was missing was streaming apps. And at the time I thought, man, this is an oversight on their part. But then they're like, you just get a separate box. You're better off. It's like people trying to do streaming through their TV apps. It's garbage. It's flaky. It doesn't work good. You always want to do a separate streaming box. So they were ahead of the curve on that by not supporting it in the player. What this player does so well is the fact that it does every format known to man. It does DVD audio, SACD, does Blu-ray, Ultra HD Blu-ray, DVD, um, and it does it masterfully. Every format it does, it does masterfully. The interface is quick on it. The video quality is excellent. Now, they had a 203 and a 205 model. The only difference was the analog front end on the 205 is obviously better. So if you use the analog outputs, you're getting, you're getting a state-of-the-art preamp. I measured the preamp outputs on this thing. You could actually use this as a preamp and a source device and just plug a power amplifier and speakers and you're done. If you really, if you want to just enjoy two-channel audio or SACD, or even multi-channel up to seven channels without doing Atmos, you could use this as a preamp. So this thing was just the build quality, the sound quality, the measurements, the interface, the user experience, everything on this player. I still use it almost every day. It's in my rack in my home theater room. There are people on eBay that are selling these for four or $5,000. I've had offers for that, and I still won't sell it because... I have such a connection to this player. And when they announced that they were getting out of the business, I actually shed a tear for them because I thought Oppo was such an awesome company. They were doing it right. They were doing it so right that other companies were taking their products and shoehorn, shoehorning it into a case and selling it for a profit. We won't mention names, but we won't mention any names. We won't mention any names. Water under the bridge. We yeah. won't mention names. But this product was really a pivotal incredible it was the last audiophile grade ultra hd blu-ray player when they got out of the business i realized the business itself was changing that everything streaming was taking over and it's an unfortunate it's a good thing at some point because i love streaming i'd say 80 percent of what i do i stream through apps but when i want to get serious about audio quality or video quality i go right back to this thing i put in an ultra hd blu-ray like the new top gun movie for example and i'm just in um, it's a it's a mar it's a engineering marvel to me to be able to have all of this performance in one box, and it wasn't that expensive when it came out. I think it was like twelve hundred bucks. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And Gene, it's rune ready. That's true. Yeah. I I have the UDP two hundred five, and I have the two hundred three. I have the two hundred three connected to the Denon eighty five hundred, and that's what I use as my rune endpoint to stream and connect to the Denon. Yeah. These things are not outdated. The no. build quality is bulletproof. You have balanced. I mean, look at the detail of that balanced analog out for yep. twelve hundred dollar with ESS DAX. The ninety thirty eight, or it's like the very like one of the best DAX Pro, that yeah. ESS made at its time. Yeah, I mean, it had better DAX in it than you know dedicated AV processors that used ESS yep. that were more money. So yeah, I, I it's an outdated. I mean, it's not outdated. It's a discontinued product, but it's a product that that has survived my reference system. And there's very few products that stay in my rack for more than a few years. So this thing has been in my rack since the day I reviewed it, and it's not going anywhere. And it'll probably stay in that room until it dies. There isn't a single standard that has come out 
uh, recently that makes this player obsolete. Yeah. That's the great thing about it. So I guess it's back to me. And going back to my salon setup is I love, I love, I love my benchmark AHB2 power amps. This is a, it's a class H. And um, I think I first got wind of this amp somewhere in the neighborhood of around 2017 or so. Maybe it was a little bit earlier. I don't remember. Um, But I was hearing wind about this product that had super low distortion, incredible Mm -hmm. measurements. And I'm like, okay, let me see what's what. So, you know, I caught, I reached out to benchmark and I spoke with, uh, John Seau, who was one of the principal engineers, um, behind the product. I spoke with, uh, Lori Finchman, uh, if I'm remembering Lori's name, right. He was a speaker designer over at Kef before Andrew Jones. And they were really instrumental in doing the THX AAA, uh, uh, feed, uh, uh, come on the, uh, I just had a brain cramp here. Yeah. The feed uh, forward design or whatever. Forward, um, design. And so I said, all right, give me, give me a couple of amps. Um, they'll run in, in bridge mono. So that's the way that I've been running them. So I'm getting 380 Watts out of a package like this. They're tiny. amps, Yeah. Yeah. They're pint size, basically. Amazing. Just amazing. And for all you audio nerds that like the sign ed stuff, if you want to convert that 0.0003%, that's 110 dB sign ed. So that's extremely low distortion. The only amplifiers that I've measured that are at that level are like the new um, Purify amplifier that NAD uses, the Class D. So it takes a really state-of-the-art Class D amplifier to match the distortion and noise of this amplifier. It's exceptional. Um, I got mine uh, done with the rack plate because I, I was going to say, rack. what is that? I'm like looking at this. I'm like, it it gives you an idea. So here's a standard 19 yeah. inch rack and it gives you an idea of how small this thing is. Yeah. So yeah, I was running. So I was running a lexicon uh, seven channel amp and that's how I was powering the salon twos. And then with this thing came in, I could not believe uh, I love the size. I love the look of it. The performance was exceptional and it's just so smart. So here it is in my other rack. That's uh, hilarious. I know that I didn't know they did that. Yeah. So yeah. you can order them either standalone or you could order them with the rack faceplate. So you have no idea that it's this little thing behind it. And it's, it's funny the way that it sits, but it's gorgeous. The build quality, the aesthetics of this. Does it run cool? Camp, super duper cool yeah I, I it blows me away how well designed how well engineered this is my two channel reference so i have one for each of the salons these are my power amps and if i want to do anything reference this is what i'm what i'm feeding it to and if you look at it because you know benchmark does a lot of really pro reference grade things and and their preamps which i've had come through my setup are they're just unbelievable. They're, they're exceptional. And notice they have speak on connectors. Mm -hmm. So they're really made for pro, but they also have, um, binding posts as well. And apparently from what I recall with one of my conversations with John Seau, he said that it's this amp is so sensitive. If you want to have the lowest distortion, you actually need to use the speak on connection. If you use yeah. a, a spade or a banana, they can measure the difference. Oh, yeah, because you get inductance from those. Yeah, yep. I've seen I've seen that when I measured the NAD amp. If I didn't change my whole test fixture, I could not get close to the distortion levels that they're talking about. So to measure a difference of like 6 dB of distortion, it doesn't sound it sounds like a lot, but it's like you're talking about tenths of a thousandth of a fraction of a decimal point. It's it's like the hair on a gnat's ass, basically. You're trying to measure, <laughs> and <laughs> people get caught up in the numbers, you know. And it's good housekeeping. It's not to say that you can you can't hear these levels of distortion, but the fact that you can make something that good from an engineering standpoint, why not do it if you can? Exactly. It takes balanced in only, and yeah. look at you can set the sensitivity of the amp to match the output of your preamp 
that's that's feeding it or your your AVR. What was the price of these uh, amplifiers? Do you remember? It's. I think it's. Somebody check me on this. I think it's twenty nine ninety five each. Okay. Uh, retail is what it goes for. But it's you know it's the detail. Look, it's got two triggers. It's got a trigger in and a trigger out. And it doesn't matter which one you use. It it has a locking power cord. It's just every little yeah thing about this performance design look. It just checks off all the boxes. And, well, look, uh, you, you built it. you built a two channel system that has some of the best passive speakers ever made. You built it with some of the lowest distortion, highest performance subwoofers. So why not have the very lowest distortion amplifier to complement it, right? I mean, it's just you're trying you're trying to build a true reference in terms of state of the art performance, but also you want to have a system that sounds incredibly well too. So. It is uh, when they did a show, and I'm trying to remember um, his his name escapes me. They did five of these in a 5.1 system with uh, Salon twos, and it was apparently just for for multi channel music, and apparently it was just spectacular. So mm. yeah, I uh, I love these. So there's a the back of one of them. You can see I've got a I've got a speak on connection, um, and it's a blue jeans cable, and then I have a welded spade that's going to uh, the Salon two and yeah i'm so glad you're not into the cable nonsense that you know that you go for the performance in the electronics but you don't go and pray to the cables i, I have no problem i've got a i've got a nordos a, a blue blue heaven i think uh, mm -hmm. and it's a great it's a great cable i didn't buy it because i expected it to improve my performance i love the cable and oh, Nordos makes pretty cables for sure they do it's yeah. and it's a very nice cable but it's not the one that i'm using uh, here, yeah. so there you go. So Gene, back to so you. So people probably laugh when I put this on the list. I know it's it's a cheap device that everybody has probably in their system, but man, I get, I get so much entertainment out of this freaking box, and it's and you can buy them on Amazon for literally Gen three sixty four gigabit for like one hundred seventy bucks, one hundred eighty bucks. And I'm not an Apple person, as you know. I can't. I know. It. I think the company is deplorable, but this is a good product. I have to, they, they make two really good products. The Apple, the iPad is in my opinion, the best out of all those tablets. And the Apple TV is my favorite streamer. I've had them all. I've had the, I've had the Roku, which I like. I still use that in another system. I had fire TV, which I don't recommend, especially if you're trying to do any type of home automation or control system. Um, the only one I haven't tried is the NVIDIA, which I've heard great things about, but the Apple TV just does so many things really well. And the fact that it has Apple music, Apple music and spatial audio has been transformative to me. We've done videos on this before. I've talked about how to get spatial audio. If you are into music and you're not listening to spatial audio, now you're really missing out because there's so much unique content that's mixed natively in spatial audio and of all the streaming services that I've tried, I've tried Tidal, which I love. I use Tidal in my desktop all the time. I've tried Amazon HD. I've tried, uh, the only one I don't use is, um, what are the three big ones? We have Amazon HD, Apple Music, Tidal. Oh, I have Cobuzz. Cobuzz is only two channel. I don't use Spotify and they don't support spatial audio. So out of all the ones I've tried, Apple Music has the best library of spatial audio. It's one of the only ones that I've found. It is the only one that I found that doesn't have a disparity between um, levels when you go from spatial audio to two channel. It's maybe a couple of dB difference. I have to go up and down the volume control. When I go on Tidal, it's like almost 10 dB between spatial audio and two channel. So I just think Apple's, Apple's putting more focus on spatial audio. And it's not for the home theater crowd. They're probably doing it because they're the, one of the only ones that have the head tracking on their headphones that support spatial audio. So they're doing spatial audio for headphones, but at the same time, we're benefiting as home theater people that we can listen to native spatial audio with discrete speakers, not just with headphones. And this device allows that level of enjoyment that I haven't found on anything else. I, I agree. And yeah, I want to do a quick shout out if I can to rib one of my friends, uh, Nick Verderis, because I have Chris Flosaurus and Nick Verderis listening on the West Coast. So, Nick, I think you need to get an Apple TV to, um, you know, do all the 80s uh, techno and all that great music uh, that you love, all that European stuff. So, 
it'll be good. Gene, the the mixing, um, do you find a problem? Uh, I use the Apple TV every single day. It is the device other than my AVR that de facto. Do you find any quality issues with uh, Apple Music streaming through the uh, HDMI port? Like any, anything? So a couple of times, this is weird. And I don't know if it was Apple TV or Storm. Um, a couple of times I had audio break up and I had to literally restart the whole system. Okay. And I don't know if it was an internet connection because I've got a one gigabit switch. I've got 500 meg up and down. I've got Luxel equipment throughout the house. Two or three times over the last year or so, I had to restart the whole system or sometimes on Apple Music, I'll put an album there and it won't play. I have to delete it, bring it back. So there's some, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. So I've had little issues like that every now and then i'll get a lip sync issue that has something to do with the frame rate the setting on the frame rate matching mm -hmm. frame rate and content that i believe uh maybe that could be causing it but generally speaking all of my experiences have been pretty solid with it and do you notice anything like my my hesitancy because i had some bad experience with um the quality of uh airplay uh, back in the early iterations and the fact that they're using Dolby Matte, and you know, you have a 48 kilohertz ceiling, uh, that we know of on the, the HDMI output, it, it's sort of, I don't know, it's sort of been an, a psychological impediment for me, yeah. um, really getting into Apple TV as my, my primary music device. Well, the, here's the thing. I know people are, I've heard people say that, and I don't see the sampling rate as being a problem because if you're running Dirac, you're at 40 kilo, 48 kilohertz anyway. So you're already down converting a 96 kilohertz or 192 kilohertz to run your room correction. The only exception maybe is YPAL, which is the least sophisticated out of all the room correction systems. But so, for some reason, Yamaha supports 96K in their room correction platform. I'm not sure if Odyssey does. I don't think Odyssey does. No, I could be wrong. Our, I, I'll have to double check that. I think you're right. Uh, there yeah. may be a difference. I don't. Arc Genesis doesn't support 96k. Arc used to be 96k. Oh, okay. Then okay. So Arc I, does. I'll have to double check. But I know for a fact Direct doesn't. And most, when you start applying base management or room correction, you're going to be at that limitation anyway. I think Apple TV does support 24 bit. So I think when you are yeah, on 24 bit, 48 uh, right. kilohertz is what it's sampled to. I mean, what you really should do is, is set up your nucleus, right? And stream a high res signal on that and stream it on your Apple TV, get them synced up and have somebody mm. change the inputs on you and see if you can hear a difference. I doubt you'll hear a difference. That's why I was getting, my next question was going to ask you is why would I need room nucleus when I have Apple TV? I um, have all my, I built my libraries. I mean, obviously I can't pull from my NAS. I have a NAS in my system. I can't pull it through Apple TV, right? Uh, you probably need something like a Rune to manage that. Uh, actually, I do that through my Oppo. I run a NAS through my Oppo, and I do that when I want to pull pull it off. No, I those are all they're all science uh, academic ventures at some point, right? Yeah, what you can actually do. Um, it's interesting because uh, come on, what's his name? I'm I'm blanking. He had put together, uh, you know, can you tell the difference between a high res and a, a Mark Waldrop? Mark, yeah, yeah, with yeah, Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> and I ran that test through the salons. My wife and my kids could tell the difference between the files. So, uh, you know, the, the theory there is if you have a resolving, but it's hard. I listened and there were there were certain points where. I thought I could perceive a difference, but it was only at very specific parts of the file. And I remember I guessed it correctly, but I was in the wrong. I said, that one's the CD, that one's the high res. So it's it was interesting because I thought he came back years later and said that there's really, you can't hear a difference as long as it's at least uh 48 K or 16 bit or something. I thought I read he did a second study on that. I think it really depends on the mix too. I mean, it has to be an identical mix for you to make a fair comparison. But I mean, I'm, I still have a bias towards SACD for two channel. Like I put on a two channel SACD and I just get lost in it. And it may be it's placebo. I, who cares? I like the format. I have some incredibly good recorded music on SACD and I still listen to it on my Oppo. I'll put on... I have a whole collection in my in my um, 
in my closet and I'll just go in there one night and I'm like, you know what? I don't want to stream tonight. I'll put on Patricia Barber on SACD or I'll put on Dire Straits, something like that. And I just get lost in it. It's a great experience, but I miss the artwork. I miss the album art that you don't get. And you get that with Apple TV. I like seeing the lyrics. So I lean more towards streaming now because I like seeing the lyrics come up. I like reading the lyrics while I listen to music. It just does something different to your brain. I, I agree. Well, it's my favorite. I digressed you because I wanted to find out what your experience. We haven't talked about this in a while. So I'm going to yeah. do a little bit of a deeper dive now. into. It's the, a good uh, question. I mean, I wonder it too. I wonder what I'm missing. I know we're missing when we do spatial audio streaming. We're not getting true HD. We're getting uh, Adobe Digital Plus. Unfortunately, nothing streams in lossless right now. I mean, I would buy the I'd buy some of this content if I was really into it, um, but I'm still loving the experience of the spatial audio. And I just I haven't said to myself, I really wonder what this would sound like if I had the disc. That's because it's just been such an enjoyable experience. Do you love the interface? I wouldn't say yeah, love maybe. it. I tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it better than some of the other ones. I think there's some things Apple TV does that pisses me off. Like if I want to get to the album, sometimes it's a challenge or like pausing it and getting back. And there's just some kludgy things I don't like about it, but I don't know. I've gotten so used to it now. I put it this way. I have a home automation system. I use control Four, but I still find that I have to have the Apple remote in my hand because I just could enter. I could move that thing around much quicker with that little silver remote yeah. than I could do through my control Four system. Good stuff. Yeah. So kick it back to me. Since you chose Apple TV, I had to choose something else. How's that? Okay. And and to and me, you're it's... the Apple you're the Apple fanboy, and I'm the one that's I am. Preaching. I am the Apple <laughs> fanboy, and I am so like to me, the Apple TV product is amazing. But and here's the but: if I want to check off those boxes of I want something that uh, gives me a ton of flexibility has a lot of technology built in, uh, supports different things. This is the product that totally blew me away. The Cambridge Audio CXN V2. And now they've come out with a, a series too. This network streamer, I love everything about it. So er, the way that this thing is designed, so you have Ethernet, you have USB, but look at it. You've, you've got digital... Um, outputs out of it. You can use this thing as a USB DAC. It has two channel balanced uh, output as well as line uh, um, RCA output. This thing is a Rune endpoint. So I use this to stream all of my, my Rune and I connect this to the Anthem AVM60. There isn't anything that I can't do with the um with the cambridge it's stable it works the user interface is great and it's got a screen on the front so that way if i want to um, see what's playing it adds that little aesthetic element um just yeah th this is really a spectacular product so can you so, see the can you see the album art on your phone through it through um no it does that's not the way that it would work in this particular case i actually i don't use the app it's called stream something or other but I so have if you're, to, sitting, if you're sitting 20 feet away from but, it, how do you read what's on the display? Well, you don't. Oh. What I do is if I'm streaming with Rune, which in this particular case I am, I'm seeing all the album art on my phone. And that's how I'm experiencing it in that particular case or, you know, on my television or, or what have you. Um, but yeah, th this thing does Chromecast, AirPlay. So what I am plus Rune Rat. So those of you who are, uh, rune fans what i can do is i can create a an instance of uh the cambridge as a chromecast endpoint uh streamer as an airplay and a native rune rat and then i can actually group speaker pairs on all three protocols so mm -hmm. it it's just totally flexible it just works so for me this has really been uh, a ton of fun so my favorite uh product in, in that regard so. Do they have a version with an HDMI output so you could actually get a on-screen display or no? No, that's the only drawback is you don't have uh, any HDMI connectivity. So you but have you to do, you do get HDMI connectivity with a blue sound or no? 
now i don't remember it's been too long since i've reviewed okay. one of the blue sound products i don't remember see i just haven't it sounds great i just have not been motivated to look at products like this when i have an apple tv <laughs> it's just yeah. it's hard because i it's so convenient and i get lost for hours in my theater room already finding new music so i don't know you have you're gonna have somebody's to... you know looking for so in terms of the cost i don't remember uh, I think that this unit, the V, the um, the CXN V2 Gen 1, which is what this one is that I have, I think now it's like $800. And then they've come out with a Series 2. And I think the Series 2 is somewhere around um, $1,200. But but somebody can just quickly look that up on the Cambridge Audio site. And now Cambridge Audio, great build quality, right? Yeah. It's bulletproof. They keep the firmware up to date. Uh, Rune was a free add-on. So all of these things just really make it a great product. And the differentiator for me, Gene, uh, is that is really the Rune integration and the multi-protocol support. So if the Apple TV to me has a place. It just doesn't mm -hmm. meet what I need in terms of that extended ecosystem. So I use this for um, all the reviews. So it's either this guy or the, op the Oppo UDP uh, 205 that I have. So it's mm -hmm. great. Awesome. So good stuff. And so this is not something that is for generating audio or produ reproducing audio, but it's probably the most important element of a room. You have to be comfortable when you're sitting, right? And these seats, man, I've I've had many a times where I've had better sleep in these seats than in my own bed. I mean, I just sink into it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go, man. relaxed i love i love the lumbar support i love the uh the contoured headpiece so it doesn't destroy the uh the sound i get from behind and to the sides of me um i just can't say enough things about i've got valencia seating in my family room a custom one there uh, but i prefer these are my favorite these are more theater style seats they're just really contoured I like the custom finish that I got that matches the decor and the color theme of the room. They're reasonably affordable. They're not super expensive. Now they're not built to the level of like a Cinetech or, you know, some of the higher end chairs, but I'm telling you, man, these things, the thing about them is when you recline on them, I'm almost six foot. So my feet aren't hanging off, you know, like, like most of these theater chairs where you're not even just your feet, but like, the bottom half of your leg are hanging off. I'm fine with my feet hanging off and maybe my ankles a little bit, but I hate when you get into a recliner and your half your leg is hanging off the thing. And they even have an extended version of these for really tall people. So I don't know. Have you ever sat in a Valencia seat? I will when I come to your house. That's true. I'm looking you're, forward you're to You're going to like them. I don't like necessarily my theater chairs. Mm -hmm. When you, and so let me share this little, uh, tidbit when gene got these i get a text dude i just got the valencia seats and these things are the most comfortable theater seats i've ever been in and from that point on you have not stopped talk speaking volumes about mm -hmm. um, the quality and and the comfort what i like about them too is you my theater seats i have to have something in between because my armrests don't have the cup holders so i have to have this little wedge in between it just adds more length to the row but this has everything built in and then you also have storage built into the arms as well right storage and then you have swing arms you could put on top we see those little metal round discs things on the on the top so they sent me some swing arms and i could put a wine caddy there if i want to put like a glass of wine i could put it i have a table in the back row i don't know if you can see it by my subwoofer on the right side there's a little table there and that's where i put my laptop so i sit in that seat and i when I do all my room measurements and then I put the microphone in the front. That's great. That's great. So somebody, I will tell you firsthand, if I had my theater seats to do over, I would have called Gene and this is what I would have done. Cause you know, you're going to spend a certain amount anyway to do the theater seating and it just, it makes a difference. Um, do you, I don't know about you, but do folks understand that, bad theater seats or super high theater seats interfere with the acoustic response i think it's definitely worth a video topic for sure yeah right 
because you know you so here's the simple test and that's why i'm curious the way the head rest design is you know if you move forward in your seat a little bit you'll notice especially the mid-range and and the the mid base there'll be a change whereas yeah. if you had your head into the seat versus uh slightly forward and, and some folks think oh my room correction didn't do a good job and they don't think it's actually my seat and oh, yeah. where my ears are in relation to the seat it makes a difference acoustically yeah oh for sure i mean it's nothing's perfect but these are pretty darn good you probably don't see it, but I have a bunch of Star Trek blankets. I have one of those upside down. That's the one on the left is the Enterprise upside down with Starfleet symbols on it. Man, that I geeks. noticed. We're such geeks, man. We are the Star Trek geeks <laughs> that we are. It's all good. So there you are sleeping. So yeah, you got to have priorities in life. I mean, that that look at the end of the day. Um, yeah, all this stuff sounds great. It's great gear, but at the end of the day, it's an experience. I look forward. I work my ass off all week long. I'm here doing videos or editorials or whatever. I want to enjoy myself on the, on Friday and Saturday night. I don't mess with working, man. I come in my theater room and I literally start listening to music. I post stuff on our community tab. I share music with our audience and they share music with me as well. So I've, I've learned of a lot of new artists just from doing that exchange. And I think Maybe we should do that more regularly. Maybe we should just do live streams on music because I think that's really the essence of why we're in this. I mean, I know we like watching movies and watching TV, but come on, we're all about the music. That's why I bring on drummers like Antonio Sanchez and Gavin Harrison from Porcupine Tree. I like the music, man. That's the whole focus of why I got into audio ever since I was a kid. It's always been about the music and always been about just creating the atmosphere to enjoy it. The gear, I think, is an, a means to an end. And I think what I love about the the audio, um, the hobby, I can't tell you, it's really been some of the most wonderful people are in this hobby. Um, you know, some of the dealers, the manufacturers, the folks that, um, you know, that have the same passion. But once we get caught up in, in specs and, and all these these things, I think we really do lose focus. If if we look at what it was that was a musical experience for us, it may have been a concert. It may have been listening to a boombox. It may have been a cassette. It, it doesn't matter, an LP. And that's the end game right there is I think all of the gear ultimately it has the point of simply helping us to get closer to the music and, and reliving that experience. The moment we lose focus of that and focus on the gear only. Right. Dude, so, when I was just to give you a quick story of, of my childhood, when I was maybe six years old, seven years old, my brothers all had these systems in their rooms, these big speakers with 12 inch woofers and the, the paper ones, you could smell it when you walked in, right? Like these old fashioned 1970s speakers. My brother would put on a Genesis record, you know, like uh, Duke or um, Trick of the Tail, one of these classic records. And I would get my little tape recorder and I would put it by a speaker. I would record it so I could go back in my room at night and listen to it. I listened to it on the little portable tape recorder. And then I got sophisticated. And I got headphones. So, I mean, as a kid, I had this drive for audio and it was all because I was exposed to it from my brothers. I had four older brothers. We all liked music and that we all had that connection. We fought. My brothers were sometimes real dicks to me, but we always came together when it came to music. We all liked the same kind of music. We would sit down. My brother would never want me in his room unless we were listening to music. Then he's like, come on in. I just got this new Yes record. Let's go listen to Close to the Edge. Shut the door, listen to Close to the Edge, put on his lava lamps, and we just sit back and enjoy it. And it's that kind of stuff that... Um, never left me that's like one of my biggest outlets in life is getting the escape with music it's true I, and like i said it's the universal language that uh who was it Did jim or somebody said that and that's been a great bond for me with my brother-in-laws out you know here and on the west coast is they're both into music they've got great taste in music they're eclectic knowledgeable and mm -hmm. we can just really get lost in talking about artists and then we have these private exchanges. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah. It's, oh, awesome. it's all good stuff. It's all good stuff.
Well, Ted, I appreciate you putting this together. And that, hey, guys, check out his video he just did on the multiple calibrations. Um, I want Teo to do more videos for us. He's a very energetic, very positive guy. So give him some love. Not every video has to be done by me. I, I could use the help, trust me. And uh, Teo and I are really good friends. I really respect what you do, Teo. And yeah. uh, your enthusiasm is infectious. Um, sometimes people think, oh, is this a paid review? No, this guy loves this stuff. If you okay? can't tell, right? Yeah. I mean, that's you're what you're always smiling. You crack me up with your smile, man. You just have this love of life and it, and it's intoxicating. And I need more people like that uh, around me in life. And I want to bring this energy to our channel. So I do appreciate you getting more involved in this with us. I know you got a day job and, and you got family and stuff like that. But man, anytime you could do videos for us and you could come on here on a live stream, I value that and I appreciate that. And I'm, well, I think our you. fans will as well. Uh, Gene, it just goes without saying you know, for 20 years, whatever it's been, you've really just been a pioneer as well. You know, the love and respect that I have for you and what you've been able to do with the industry. And no matter where I go, uh, whether, you know, we've gone down together to New Orleans to, you know, that that big event, you know, I've been out in California and, and everybody at Harmon loves you to see um, the folks at Denon and Marantz, the Yamaha, right, et cetera, et cetera. They all yep. pay you a tremendous amount of respect. It's it's your your knowledge, holding folks accountable, um, your pursuit of audio truth and engineering and really being a great advocate for us as enthusiasts, um, because you have made a decided impact in products because of your um, your drive. Whole product lines have been launched. Manufacturers have changed specs. They've um, made engineering changes to products. So really kudos to you, we really um, appreciate everything that you've done. And I'm just really been honored for, I think, what, what's it been like 10, 12 years we've been, it's been um, a while, you know, yeah. doing this. So it's really been a joy for me and an incredible privilege. So love it. Awesome. Appreciate that. We got one more super chat here and then we'll close this out. Let me click this. Nicholas, Nicholas again. Tara, I'm running a Shield Pro via HDMI getting 96K on my Anthem. Awesome. Should I be using another product, maybe Rune Nuclea or Blue Sound Node via coax? I don't think so, because especially if you're running Arc, it's being downsampled anyway to to 96K. So I wouldn't obsess too much on it, frankly. And uh, as long as you're running um, uh, coaxial digital, a spit of connection from uh, the Shield Pro, oh, via HDMI. Listen, I think you're going to be fine. Enjoy the mm -hmm. music. Love it. If you're missing something, then worry about it. That's my my raw advice to you. Here's a comment about you. It's because of Teo that if you buy Crooks, who's my number one song for 2022? Was that a, a recommendation you did? I don't follow that one. I, I'm missing that one myself. So, yeah. okay. Mark, <laughs> I don't know if you can quantify that or qualify that a bit because I'm not. I'm missing the reference too. Well, look, just to give you guys some updates, there's this is a busy couple of months for us going forward. I'm going to Sound United at the end of January. They're having a press event. Um, I think I'm going to be getting the Morant separates or some other new product that they're going to be announcing there. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm also going to audio advice in February because Martin Logan's coming out with something new that I can't talk about yet. But that's in the pipe. Uh, I'm going to be going to visit Audio Advice. I can't wait to check out their facility and their demo rooms. We have RBH Sound coming here, I think, at the end of January. I'm like trying to keep track of all this. <laughs> We're installing a 21 inch sub and some new speakers up here. Um, so that's going on. I've got another company coming to do some power surge protection in my panels. That Surge Pure is the company called in March. And then what else do we have? I know there's one more thing that's happening. Well, we're going to have you here as well. After I get that 21 installed. I'm, I'm game for that. That's a done deal. Yeah. Do that. I'll, I'm sorry I'll miss Shane, who is the nicest guy on the planet, by the way. He, he really is. I mean, both of you guys are. But, yeah, <laughs> he is really a nice guy. All right. Well, guys, oh, I appreciate. Uh, test, based test track, I guess. Maybe that's what it is. Oh, it must have been in one of your reviews. I, it, I'm blanking on that as a base test track. So, so uh, Power Guy Mark, I'm, I feel terrible. I don't know the reference on that one. So, yeah. 
All right, guys. Well, it is right. way past your bedtime. This is when I get my best work done. So I'll be signing off and working on something. But Tao, I'll let you get back to it, man. I appreciate you coming here, dropping knowledge with us on your favorite products, my favorite products. Some of them are in common. We've had both of them. So it's awesome. Guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to us if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. Until next time, my friends. Keep listening.